Hey guys, welcome back. I've been uh, kind of absent from YouTube for the last probably few months now. And yeah, Jesse and I have been kind of going through some really challenging times as of late. And I know probably you guys have been experiencing the same. This world has really become really quite a, a tough place to, to be in as of late. And I know most people are going through some some challenging times. So but as of late, at least the last few weeks anyway, I've been kind of more inspired to kind of shoot some new videos because, I mean, with this EMF business that I'm doing, I'm I'm really doing a lot of interesting things out there right now. And I'm meeting some very interesting clients. And I'm doing some, some very interesting research and getting some new insights into things. And I really wanted to kind of start sharing some of this stuff with you guys here. And... The first video that I wanted to do here, which is really a, a subject that's come up more and more with uh, most of the clients that I deal with out in the field, and it has to do with Wi-Fi. More and more people are really becoming more concerned about the, the Wi-Fi in their space, and they want to know if what, what they can do about it. They want to know, is it safe? Is it, um, they want to know how it works. I'm getting a, a lot of interesting questions asked by by some of my clients, and I thought there's really no better way to address this than to kind of just shoot shoot some videos on it. So that's really what I'm going to do here. I'm going to kind of shoot a video series here that's really centered on the nature of Wi-Fi. And this first video that I'm going to do, it's just going to be more of an introduction to this, and I'm just going to touch on just some of the key principles behind Wi-Fi and kind of how it works because. I think that's really important for you guys to kind of see what's going on behind the scenes here, because these Wi-Fi signals that are in our home, they're invisible. You can't see them. And they operate on the very nature of frequency. There is a frequency that's being broadcasted out into our space. And it's within that frequency component. There's a lot of information that's packaged inside there. And that's really what I wanted to kind of touch on in this video so you can kind of get a better feel for this and, and, and see what it is that we're dealing with because it's it I think it's important because there's something that I see here on what Wi-Fi could be evolving into where we're going with this because Wi-Fi is a technology that's evolving it's a, it's it's been evolving ever since its birth and it's important to know that and I'm gonna touch on this in, in the next slide here to kind of show you exactly that, how that's progressed over the years. Now in this video here, I'm kind of introducing a new kind of format to kind of how I'm delivering some of this information to you guys, because there's a lot of stuff that I want to cover and I want to make sure I, I don't miss anything. And I want to try and take advantage of the best kind of interface here to kind of deliver some of this information to you. So this is a, this is something new that I'm trying here. Anyway, on, on that note, let's uh, let's kind of jump right into this. Let's uh, kind of go over what Wi-Fi is. Let's let's kind of begin here. Now, Wi-Fi really what it is? It's a wireless local area network standard, and it was created by the IEEE, which is an organization called the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Now, this organization is responsible for developing these Wi-Fi standards and evolving them as the years go on. And Wi-Fi, really what it is, it's, it's used to connect our wireless devices to the internet. And it does this by means of electromagnetic radio waves. Now, this is the key on how your wireless device, like your phone, for example, connects to your Wi-Fi router. There's something invisible between your phone and your router, and it's this electromagnetic wave that's kind of connecting the two together. Now, this chart kind of here just shows you really all of the Wi-Fi standards that are available, right from the very first one that was introduced, as you can see down here at the bottom, in 1997. Now, the IEEE standards, you can see here, I'm kind of circling the, the, the column here. They follow this 802.11 kind of standard. That's the, the numbering format that's used here. And it's followed by a letter. And you can see that this is kind of how the uh, the Wi-Fi technology has evolved, and it's not so easy to follow, really. Which is why, if you look at the very first column, we have what's called the generation. And 
we've kind of followed the same format as our kind of cellular phone devices, which are, you know, kind of following that 3G, 4G, 5G, and now soon to be 6G, kind of, the, it stands for generation. So it just kind of shows you how the technology is evolving. And when we jump from one technology to the other, you can see we just kind of increase the number, which is very simple to follow. And Wi-Fi has done the same thing. As you can see down here at the bottom, it started with Wi-Fi Zero. And that was back in 1997, where the very first standard that was introduced into the population was Wi-Fi One. And this was back in 1999, actually. It's not just a little over 20 years now that this Wi-Fi has been around. It hasn't been around that long when you think about it. And I can remember the, you know, the first time I got a hold of Wi-Fi, it wasn't in 1999, I wasn't using it at that time. It wasn't until, I wanna say right around 2002. It was when I first moved to Toronto. I went here, I moved here to go to school to you know take electrical engineering technology. And we didn't have Wi-Fi throughout school at all. None of the classrooms had Wi-Fi. And it wasn't until I graduated, maybe six months after that, I remember my roommate, he kind of brought a router into our, our, our apartment at the time. And he says, yeah, I got this new technology here. This is, you know, you got you to see this. And of course, it was a, a wireless router. So that was kind of the first time that I ever got introduced to that. But at that time, I didn't have anything to connect to it. Like my cell phone, I didn't have a smartphone at that time or anything like that. My, um, my computer was just hardwired into, you know, the, the modem at the time. So I, I didn't take advantage of any of the wireless. But I was introduced to that in 2002. And we're gonna talk about that date and that timing here in a minute, because it is significant. And then from Wi-Fi 3, you can see we've, we've jumped up from four to five. Actually in my home right now, that's what I'm using. I'm using Wi-Fi 5 and it's a combination of Wi-Fi 4. So I'm using a combination of five and four because if we look at Wi-Fi 5, it's, using, it only, it's only available on the five gigahertz frequency. And I don't use that frequency in my home here because it doesn't, I, I don't use Wi-Fi in my own, my home period, but there's times when I, you know, Jesse and I do need to turn it on if we're doing like a, a Zoom call or, or something, but it's just, you know, for a very short time. But the five gigahertz I don't use in my home because it doesn't travel through walls and concrete and brick and uh, it, it physical ob objects seem to kind of attenuate the five gigahertz very easily. Whereas the 2.4 gigahertz, which is the frequency that is most common, this seems to kind of travel through walls and ceilings much more effortlessly. So just kind of wanted to, to bring that up, but that's what I'm using in my home. I have kind of a combination of Wi-Fi 5 and Wi-Fi 4, but what's important right now is Wi-Fi 6 is the newest standard that's out there, especially here in Canada. It was released here in 2019, as you can see, but this is what's available. And we're going to touch on Wi-Fi 6 in a minute because this is going to be important to, to, to talk about. But one thing I wanted to kind of bring up here is that Wi-Fi, really it runs on four different carrier waves. So from when your, your router is emitting that Wi-Fi signal into your space, there is a specific carrier wave that's carrying all that information. And there's four of them that we actually use. And the most common one, and we're gonna talk about this one here, is the, the 2.4 gigahertz frequency. This is the most popular frequency that's, that's, that's really out there. And it's one that I measure in people's homes, and it seems to be the one that's the most intense in people's homes. And most of the clients that I go and see, this is the case. And we're gonna talk about why this is the case in a minute, but. The 2.4 gigahertz is the most common kind of Wi-Fi frequency that's available. And most of your routers, if you guys have one, if you're using Wi-Fi, it will have the 2.4 gigahertz. And that's probably what you're using. And five gigahertz is also available. You can see here number two, that's another common frequency. And number three, we actually are introducing a new frequency in, uh, in the Wi-Fi spectrum, which is six gigahertz. And I want, this is going to be a very important one to kind of touch about in a few minutes here. But if you look up here again in the top left corner, you can see Wi-Fi 6E. If we scroll all the way over here to the right, you can see it's operating on three different frequencies now. And this is something very, very, very new. 
and it's using the 2.4 gigahertz, the 5 gigahertz, and now it's introducing 6 gigahertz. So this is a completely new frequency that's just being released into people's homes. Now I have a highlighted here 2022 in red because this is actually when it's just being released here in Canada. We're going to touch on this in a minute. We'll come back to this. Now the last carrier frequency I just wanted to touch on here is something that's actually called YGIG. Now what YGIG is, it's a, it's a Wi-Fi communication protocol that's really used for, for virtual reality gear, like these headsets that people are buying and putting on, the, on their heads. Those headsets, a lot of them, will be operating on this 60 gigahertz frequency that they're going to be able to connect to. And they're going to be wearing these things on their heads, believe it or not, which is absolute insanity to me. But anyway, this is where the world is going. So 60 gigahertz is another frequency that I'm not going to talk a lot about that frequency in this video because it's, there's so much to talk about with that one. I'm probably going to dedicate a video in the future about that one. But in this video here, I just want to kind of just really focus on the 2.4 gigahertz frequency because this seems to be the most common. So most of the slides that come here in the, in the, in the next few minutes are going to be kind of centered around this, this particular frequency. Now, the 2.4 gigahertz, like I mentioned earlier, it's, it's the most intense frequency that I'm measuring in people's homes. And that's because it's not just used for Wi-Fi. It's also used for Bluetooth devices. It's used for some baby monitors. It's used for cordless phones. It's even used for your microwave oven that cooks your food. So this particular frequency is very important to how you're cooking your chicken or whatever it is that you, you cook in your microwave. I hope you guys don't use a microwave because I, I, I don't think they're good for you at all. That's my personal opinion. And Jesse and I don't even have one in our house, but they are available. And it's important to know that it's it's operating around the same frequency that the Wi-Fi is running in your home. Now, what's important about this 2.4 gigahertz is that this is this this particular frequency is actually absorbed by water. So the water molecules that are inside of our body, the water mole molecules that are inside your food that you put in your microwave oven. I mean, this is the very principle on how your microwave oven works. It's vibrating the water inside the food. And you vibrate faster and faster and faster and faster, it starts to heat up. So this is important to kind of touch on. We're going to come back to this again in, in, in a few minutes here, but it's very important to know this. And the 60 gigahertz frequency that we are now introducing into people's homes that are going to be running these virtual reality headsets this is known to be absorbed by the oxygen molecule. Now, I wanted to bring this information up to you guys because the two frequencies, two out of the four frequencies that we're introducing into people's homes are absorbed by the very two, two molecules that are vital for sustaining the, the very life inside your body. And all the life processes that happen inside your body, water and oxygen are clearly fundamental. And these two frequencies are known to be absorbed into those molecules. <laughs> and we think that this uh, this technology is 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 safe to be putting into people's homes, which is it's absolute insanity what we're doing here. But it's important for you guys to kind of see this, and I wanted to kind of bring this up here. Now, this next slide is kind of just showing you. The, the newest standard that we're using, this Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E technology here in Canada, this is the newest standard that's available. And it was released in 2019, but what I want to show you down here at the bottom is something that I found here with Rogers specifically. Now, Rogers is offering a, offering a new internet service to people, and it's, it's what's called the Ignite, Ignite Internet. And I found this in an article here this, on, on, on Roger's website, and it was released back in October 31st, 2022, which is just a few months ago. And I'm going to stop and just kind of read this here so you can kind of see what, what's going on here. Rogers today announced that it's the first major provider in Canada to launch a new Wi-Fi modem with Wi-Fi 6E, the world's most powerful Wi-Fi technology. Building on the newest generation of Wi-Fi technology, Wi-Fi 6E enables multi-gigabit Wi-Fi speeds, 
ultra low lag times and increased capacity for more connections than ever before. Select customers in areas across Ontario, New Brunswick and Newfoundland, Newfoundland can take advantage of the new Wi-Fi modem for the best in-home Wi-Fi experience that will revolutionize how they game, stream, connect now and in the future. Now this was just released a few months ago and I happened to go on Roger's website to see if it's available in my area here in Mississauga. And of course it's available. No, no, no question about it. And I actually looked at uh, Bell because Bell and Rogers, by the way, these are the two main internet providers here in Canada. I mean, there's more than just Bell and Rogers, but these are the two, the, the big two. And they're both offering a new internet service that are going to be, you know, releasing this Wi-Fi 6 and 6E technology into people's homes. And Bell, you can see they're offering a service as well. And their service is available here in Mississauga as well. And for me, I don't, there's no coincidence there at all because in a previous video that I've done was showing you guys that Mississauga, Ontario is going to be one of the first smart cities here in Canada and in the world, sorry. So for us to get the, this new technology first and, and you know, quicker than anybody else, it, it just makes total sense. So this, New standard, Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E. Remember, Wi-Fi 6E is introducing a brand new frequency into people's homes, which is 6 gigahertz. And we have not done this before. So this is completely new, what we're doing here. And I found this interesting because a few months ago, I was just walking down the street just near my home. And I happened to kind of come across, you can see up in the top left corner here, there's an image. There's a, there's a green box here right beside this transformer. I saw a group of people with a, there, there was a van parked there. I wasn't sure who, what, what company they worked for. I wasn't really paying too much attention to that, but they were working on this and installing this. This was just a few months ago. And if you notice that there's a cable coming out the left-hand side of it. Now, if you follow that cable upwards and you come down to the image here in the center at the bottom, that cable went up and they, they they swung it around the LED street light. And then they swung it around the street light and you can see in the, the far image on the bottom right corner, they that's how they actually got the cable into the, into the client's home. And I saw that, I'm like, what are these guys doing? You know, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But then now just recently that I'm realizing that this new Wi-Fi 6 and 6E technology here from Rogers. They're like the first ones to be offering this to clients here in, in Mississauga. This makes total sense. Now I can't 100% say for sure that that's actually what this cable is, its intended purpose. But I, uh, it, to me, it doesn't make any sense to be any other way. And they just wanna get this technology into people's homes as quick as possible as you can see, and even if it is as messy as a connection as this, to run it up and swing it around a street light, just seems kind of crazy. And this was a few months ago, it's still like that. Even if I go outside there right now today, it's still like that. So it's important for you guys to know what's what's coming here with, uh, with the new Wi-Fi technology, and we're gonna kind of touch on what that technology is all about in a second here. But this is another article I found from the IT World Canada. And it says an expert says six gigahertz spectrum is the biggest Wi-Fi advancement in 20 years for Canada. And this was uh, May 26th of last year. Now this is a very, you have to really read this again because it's the biggest Wi-Fi advancement in 20 years. Well, if we look back at that chart that I just showed you guys, the first Wi-Fi standard came in 1999. Wi-Fi isn't it's just a, just a little bit over 20 years old. So what this is kind of suggesting here with Wi-Fi 6E and this 6 gigahertz frequency, this new frequency that they're delivering into people's homes is the biggest Wi-Fi advancement in, all, in the entire history of Wi-Fi. That's kind of how I'm interpreting this. This is how big this is. And 
in this article here, there's a few little bullet points here I want to emphasize. I'm just going to kind of read this, read this to you guys so you can see what is really going on here. Wi-Fi is about to get a lot more exciting in Canada. The Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, which is a group called ICED. Now, this group here, now, it's important to know that when you introduce a new frequency like this, you, like these companies like Rogers and Bell, they can't just use it freely. Like these frequencies have to be licensed and they actually have to be auctioned off so that they can actually utilize these frequencies. They have to pay for it. And the, the governing body here in, in Canada anyway, it's called ISIN. This is the company that's kind of governing all that. And they announced on May 6th, May 19th of last year that it has opened up a new swath of Wi-Fi spectrum in the six gigahertz frequency range, tripling the current availability spectrum, which will deliver faster Wi-Fi speeds. This new spectrum will enable Wi-Fi 6E, a new class of Wi-Fi devices that aims to address the congestion of current Wi-Fi systems. Today's Wi-Fi operated in the 2.4 and five gigahertz range, with these bands becoming increasingly congested, Wi-Fi devices need new uncrowded spectrums to reach their maximum speeds. This new six gigahertz band will provide nearly 1,200 megahertz of additional spectrum to support future Wi-Fi devices. So they're really targeting really the, the nature of the 2.4 gigahertz and being congested, which is, it's true. This is one of the most popular frequencies that out, that's out there and it's, being used by Bluetooth and all those other devices that I talked about. So here are you seeing it? This, this, this newest Wi-Fi standard, Wi-Fi 6E, just being released as we speak. People are getting this into their homes. It's a brand new frequency we've never used in people's homes before. Now let's talk about some of the Wi-Fi health risks that are out there by some of the really top physicians that have been studying this particular field for many, many years now. And one particular woman here who I admire very much with, she's done some amazing work in this field, Dr. Magda Havis. She's got her own website here. And she actually did an article, article number nine, where she talks about the 950 megahertz frequency and the 2.45 gigahertz frequency being the most lethal microwave frequencies to use. And this article caught my eye here and I started reading it. And I just want to kind of touch on a, a key takeaway here that I, I found in this article that's worth sharing with you guys. And in this article, it says, the higher the power density, which is the intensity of the radiation of the Wi-Fi signal. And the power density, that's how our, our, our measuring devices measure this Wi-Fi signal. It usually measures it with power density unless you have like a, a spectrum analyzer, it'll, it'll do something different. But the power density, it just, it just shows you how intense that radiation is coming off your Wi-Fi router. And one thing to note is that the closer you get to the source of that radiation, so the, so the closer you get to your, your router, the more intense that signal will be. So distance is your, your best friend when it comes to this stuff. So keeping your router as far away as, as, as possible is always one of the best things you can do if you must use it with the Wi-Fi. But the closer you get to it, the more intense that signal will be. So it's important to know that as, as, as I read this. The higher the power density, the intensity of the radiation, the more quickly the rats died. Now this study was all about rats here, putting rats in this, this microwave kind of frequency here and just these rats getting bombarded by it. Of the four frequencies tested, so they did test four of them, the two most lethal frequencies were the 950 megahertz, which is which is something that's used in our, our cell phone. A lot of the cell phone towers that are around, they, they use frequencies in this, in this range. And the 2.4 gigahertz frequency are commonly used for analog mobile phones, just like I said, microwave ovens, which is the 2.4 gigahertz, and both the digitally pulsed cordless phones and the wireless routers, they also use the 2.4 gigahertz. So it's a very congested frequency. The least toxic of the frequencies was the 4.54 gigahertz, which is near the five gigahertz frequency, which is very interesting, I found. 
which is five gigahertz is also a frequency we use with Wi-Fi. So you always, if you do have a router, depending on which router that you have, you'll have the option, maybe have the option to select between the five gigahertz and the 2.4 gigahertz manually. Now I'm gonna do a video and coming up, I'm, I'm gonna do a video talking more about this. So I'm not gonna get you too much into this here, but just know that that could be a possibility for you based on this article here is saying that that 2.4 gigahertz seems to be the most lethal one that we have. Now the, at the very bottom here, it continues. It says the primary site of damage from this 2.4 gigahertz frequency appears to be the blood vessels of the lung and respiratory tract with edema and hemorrhage representing changes in permeability of the vessel walls. So this particular frequency seems to be targeting the blood. And remember we talked about the 2.4 gigahertz frequency is one that is easily absorbed into water. And we know that all blood is, it's, it's, that's what it's made of, it's made of water. So the blood vessels and the lung and respiratory tract seem to be the main target of this, of this frequency, which is something very important to bring up considering all the things that we're dealing with out there with all the crazy things that are happening with, um, you know, I won't, I won't say it, I won't get into that stuff here, but you guys know what I'm talking about. But anyway, I thought this was a very interesting article to kind of talk about this particular specific Wi-Fi frequency that pretty much everybody has in their home. Now, here's another doctor that I wanted to kind of bring up here. This is actually Dr. Diedrich Klinghart. Now, this is a Lyme disease expert. He's one of uh, one of my earliest mentors, especially with me and my journey through Lyme disease and all of the things that I went through with Lyme disease and all the things that I uncovered, which is this is one of them, all the EMFs. This is one of the reasons why I do this for a living now. And this man has really been a, a, a really an inspiration of, of, of light for me at the very beginning because he's just a, a wealth of knowledge. He's seen more chronically ill patients than you know most doctors that you're going to find out there. He's got more experience with Lyme and these chronic, you know, mysterious illnesses that seem to be plaguing most of us here on the planet today. This guy's just a, a wealth of information. And he's got an article here on, on his website. Um, klinghardinstitute.com. It's called the EMF and the potentiation of pathogens and heavy metals and effective mitigation and detox is uh, kind of the, the, the article here and, and, and what he's talking about. And there's a key takeaway that I want to talk about with this particular article here, which was down at the bottom here. And it says it was known in 1973 that 2.4 gigahertz is the wavelength that destroys our ability to fight off infections. This wavelength was later selected, selected to blanket the entire Western world. And he's asking, why did we do this? And who did this? So clearly picking a frequency that's absorbed by water, regardless if it has the power, you know, density capacity as a microwave oven, obviously they're not the same. It, it doesn't have the same power as, as your microwave oven that cooks your food. So there's, there's differences here, but still it's the nature of that frequency. It, the, the receiving circuit seems to be inside the water molecule. And yet this is the frequency that we're just hammering our environment with cordless phones, with Bluetooth. I mean, everything, most of them, so many devices are connected with Bluetooth. People have these Bluetooth um, earbuds that they put into their into their ears and connected to their phone, which is insanity, insanity what people are doing. And I thought this was very interesting. This is coming from Dr. Klinghardt himself. And in this video here, this is a very interesting video that I found of him. It's a very short video here. I got the link down here at the bottom. I'll put it, I'll put the link down in the description of the video too, because it's worth watching this video. And he talks about the exposure to Wi-Fi in EMFs in this video. And you can see there really a lot of the wisdom of Dr. Klinghardt is, is, is coming to the surface in this video because, I mean, this man's been through it. And a few key takeaways. I'm not going to play the video here if you want to watch it. Like I said, the video link is here. I highly recommend you watch it. But here's a few key takeaways that he has said in this video. 
And the first one is that Lyme disease is nothing more than retrovirus activity, both DNA and RNA. And I mean, I knew this a few years ago, which is a very, very different way to look at Lyme disease than the way that we're looking at it today with being, you know, the spirochete that seems to be, you know, infecting us through ticks and seems to paralyze the immune system and seems to activate mast cells and all this other stuff. Whereas Klinghardt is taking it much, much deeper than any of this going right to, he's going right into the, the, the DNA and RNA of the cell, which is very interesting. Let's, let's talk about DNA and RNA retroviruses real quick before we continue. DNA retroviruses, these things are naturally occurring. And a lot of them are deeply rooted within memory. So there's a lot of past, a lot of past trauma is stored within this. These DNA, the, the, these DNA retroviruses seem to be very much connected into the roots of trauma and all of this other stuff that's rooted within memory. At least that's the interpretation that I'm getting from this. And I think there's a, a clear connection that we can make here. And he's also described this, these DNA retroviruses as being HERV retroviruses. This is another common uh, retrovirus that's connected into the DNA. And like I said, they're inherited from the past. So this is one component. And we also have the RNA retroviruses. And the RNA retroviruses, now again, this is just my interpretation of these. And we're gonna talk more about this as these videos go along because I see something here. And I think all, I'm just gonna speculate this, that all RNA retroviruses, these are completely artificial and man-made. The only thing that's naturally occurring is rooted within these DNA retroviruses and what's in the DNA. And we're gonna to touch more about that in, in, in the future here, but I just wanted to kind of touch on that. Now let's talk about more what Klinghardt has said in this video. Now he kind of asks himself this very question. He says, what is activating all these retroviruses? If Lyme disease is nothing more than just retrovirus activity, then what's activating them? And this is what he said. He says, well, I can sum it up in one sentence. It's the exposure to Wi-Fi radiation, the electromagnetic fields that we are bathed in now that are ever increasing that have been shown to unleash the retroviruses. So he's telling us the biggest influence that we have here that's causing chronic illness, which I think Lyme disease is rooted into so many other autoimmune diseases here that we're being diagnosed with. If we look a little deeper, we might get to this place. And he's saying that most of it is coming from the exposure to Wi-Fi specifically let alone all the other electromagnetic fields that were bathed in. Now, wow, what a bomb that is to hear from someone with this much experience and this much knowledge to be talking like this. And he goes on further, he says, our immune systems can no longer function naturally because it's just being absolutely bombarded, not just by the Wi-Fi and the electromagnetic fields he talks about, other toxins like glyphosate, heavy metals, all these other toxins that are, uh, you know, just we're getting hammered with, we're getting hammered by in, in, in our environment. He's suggesting that our immune systems can no longer function naturally. This is where we've gotten to with 
the world that we've created. And I thought about that after you said that, and I've been thinking about this in terms of other things. And these are where all these videos are soon going to take us to in, in time. But what he's suggesting with his immune systems can no longer function naturally. Like to me, this means that we need to create an AI based immune system. I mean, this is the answer here. We have an artificially controlled means of controlling your immune system. I mean, there's, there's what other method of control, like this, what other bigger method of control could you adopt on, on the human population? If what I'm suggesting is true, which I think it is. And to me, I think this is exactly what we're building right now which is going to turn out to be this artificial collective mind that um, even Jesse and I have been talking about in other videos. But I just wanted to point that out because one of the top disease, chronic disease specialists that's out there is suggesting that like our immune systems can't function in these conditions anymore unless we do something drastically. And if we don't, there's going to be something that can artificially get connected in to the human body and act like an artificial immune system. And that's exactly where I want to go. And this is the right video to talk about it because this Wi-Fi protocol that's being released, Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E and what it's all about, it can evolve into something here that might take us closer to what I'm suggesting here. So I know that's some heavy stuff. That we need to cover it, and I, I, I just wanted to put this out and, and share this with you guys. Now let's come back to this chart again. This just kind of showing the Wi-Fi generations from the very birth of Wi-Fi one back in 1999, and all the way up to our current, which is Wi-Fi six and six E. Wi-Fi seven is is on the horizon. Now in earlier slides, I had kind of four red arrow arrows that pointed to Wi-Fi one, Wi-Fi three. Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E. And I did that for a reason, and I'm going to show you in this slide here why. Because the very what I'm seeing here, now whether there's any correlation to this or not, I can't say with a sense of certainty here. This is just me speculating, sharing my opinion with you. Now, our first Wi-Fi standard was released in 1999. If we go back to 1999, this was, this was when West Nile was released. This was back in New York City. They got hammered with the West Nile disease, if you guys remember back in 1999. So I thought that was interesting. Now, if we continue, we look at Wi-Fi 3, which was released back in 2003. 2003 is when we actually had the major SARS outbreak, especially here in Toronto. I think in Toronto, it was like one of the worst places in the world for this. And this is interesting because I just moved to Toronto in 2002 to go to school. And remember, like I said, when I was in, in school there, we didn't have the Wi-Fi connected into our classrooms as you know, other universities and other places they were beginning to do that. I didn't. I was lucky. But this was being implemented in Toronto at that time, Wi-Fi 3. And SARS was a major outbreak that happened during that time. And I remember that. The place was, the city was, it was, it was crazy for, for quite a while there. A lot of people were getting sick. And if we can continue along, Wi-Fi 6, we go back to 2019. Well, what came in 2019? Well, COVID-19 started in China. Might have been the, maybe the end of 2018 when that happened. But, you know, we know China starts to play around with these technologies before most people. So there are three standards, Wi-Fi 1, 3, and 6. And we have a connection to some... Um, infectious outbreaks, you know, at these times. And the last one I wanted to talk about was Wi-Fi 6E. It says it was adopted in 2022, but here in 
Canada. It's just be re- being released now. I just showed you uh, when we talked about with Rogers back in August, a couple months ago, they're just releasing modems into people's homes that are capable of Wi-Fi 6E. So this is being released in 2022. It's happening right now. So my question is, is what infective agent is next? What do we have next? I guess time will tell. I kind of want to finish this video off here by talking about, I really want to look at what is the common denominator here between all of these infective agents here that I've just showed you that have a clear link to when we've released Wi-Fi over the last couple decades. And personally here, I see that there's, there's really two key common denominators here that I want to talk about that I think are really important to, to discuss here. And the first one is the fact that all of these infective agents that I've kind of showed you here, they're all RNA-based infections. And I think it's going to be really important to discuss this and look at the differences between DNA and RNA. Because I see a whole lot of stuff here that needs to be, I I, I want to share this with you guys because I see some stuff here. And it's very important. And really the second common denominator here that I see is the actual technology that we're using. The technology that's kind of embedded into all of these Wi-Fi protocols. And Wi-Fi uses, uh, it's a very unique modulation technique. It's called a, it's called OFDM. It stands for Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplexing. And it's combined with a technology called uh, QAM, which is something that's called quadrature, quadrature amplitude multiplexing. And these are the two technologies that I see that are really important to discuss that are kind of embedded into these Wi-Fi protocols that have been evolving over the years. And in the next video, that's exactly where we're going to go. We're going to kind of touch on both of these two key key points here that I just brought up, because I think they're important to talk about before we get into some practical things that we could look at to really protect ourselves from from Wi-Fi and some of the other wireless protocols that we're using.